Tension is classified as a conservative force. What that means is that if you take a look at it from an energy perspective, you cannot reharness the energy again, like in a spring, because the tension at the end of the day is, is used to move another object. All right, so it's a non-conservative force. Um, we're going to take it that the rope doesn't stretch, doesn't, stri doesn't shrink, because it's not going to store energy or lose any of the energy or, or gain or lose any of the force that goes along with it. And to make things easier, we're going to treat everything as scalar. All right, and we'll just cut right ahead to our first example. Okay, let's say that Jane, she's about to fall to her demise, but she's hoping that the weight of her vehicle who's running out of gas is able to pull downwards, that's able to pull her upwards to her safety. Okay, now there's the possibility that because the vehicle is so light that it ends up going up the ramp and Jane falls to her demise, but we're gonna be optimistic here. Okay, we're gonna assume that in the setup over here that the acceleration of the system will be in this manner here. So in other words, the velocity will increase in this direction over here and the velocity will increase in this direction for the car okay uh, so we take the assumption and then we do our calculations and we hope that acceleration is positive if our answer at the end of the day is negative that means our assumption is wrong and we need to sit down and recalculate everything again in the opposite direction that's all okay but we'll hope that this is correct all right so let's start drawing out our free body diagram as for Jane, we're taking it that upwards is positive. And for the car, as we mentioned, it's down the ramp is defined as positive. Okay, there's also a perpendicular dimension, which, yeah, we'll treat it as positive for now, but it'll net to a value of zero at the end anyways. Okay, and next we can start to populate out these diagrams uh, with the forces. So for the car, the force of gravity is still pulling directly straight downwards on it. Tension's going up the ramp, and we have the normal force where the normal force in all ramps are always going to be in this orientation, directly perpendicular to it. So we expect the normal force to be off at, an, at a skew like this. And if we wanted to factor in friction, if friction was involved, we know that um, as the car is going downwards, if positive was going down the ramp, then the force of friction will be going up the ramp. Or if the car was too light, then the force of friction would be going down the ramp. Luckily for us, in this case here, we don't need to worry about it, so that vector does not need to be drawn. As for tension, sorry, as for chain, uh, the tension of the rope is pulling her upwards and the force of gravity is pulling her downwards. And that's it for the free body diagrams. Let's start off by doing the calculations for the car itself. Okay, it, now one thing I wanna point out is that the F net in the perpendicular dimension is equal to zero. We're not expecting the car to float off into the sky, nor do we expect it to sink into the ramp itself. So F net perpendicular is equal to zero newtons. So instead, we're only dealing with our F net uh, inline. Okay, and now in the inline dimension, there's a component of gravity that's allowing it to go down the ramp. Just to let you know, this is it for the free body diagram. Okay, you should not be breaking down the free body diagram into its components. Okay, instead. Uh, just leave it as is. If you want to do these dotted things in afterwards, just for your reference, then by all means, go ahead and dot them in uh, to help you figure out when to use sine and when to use cosine. For example, in this case over here, uh, our FG uh, inline, we'll notice that it's opposite of theta. So our FG inline, or F net inline, which I'll just do in red, why not? Is equal to fg in line which is equal to m times g times the sine of theta and just to clarify this is mc for the mass of the car or m1 if i want to use the reference i have up here okay m1 g times sine theta what's avoiding it from accelerating it at its full potential is tension we also know that f net is equal to ma so m1 times a is equal to m1 times g times the sine of theta minus tension, and that's it. We can't move on any further. I know it's tempting to divide out m, but because there's no m in this term over here, you cannot divide the m's out. Now let's move on to the world of Jane. Okay, as for Jane, we're taking it that upwards is positive. So our F net, sure, in the y dimension, is equal to tension minus uh, mass of Jane times gravity. F net Y is equal to M2 
times our acceleration, and that's equal to tension minus m2g. And that's equation number two. Now, when we equate these together, we probably want to stick with something that which is similar between the two, which is tension. So I'm just going to isolate this for tension before I move on. So tension is equal to m2a plus m2g, and that's equation number two. Could we sub in the values right now? I suppose we could. I'm just going to create one a big generalized equation. Okay, so we're going to sub equation number two into equation number one. So we have m1a is equal to m1g times sine of theta subtract. And here's where we got to be careful. All right, a lot of people forget about the minus sign, how it needs to distribute into all the terms inside. OK, so make sure that minus sign is nice and big so that you remember to distribute afterwards. m2a plus m2g, which once we expand it out, we get m1a is equal to m1g times sine of theta minus m2a minus m2g okay and now we're trying to solve for acceleration so uh, m1a plus m2a when we bring it over is equal to m1g times sine theta minus m2g so when we isolate for a a is equal to m1g times sine theta minus m2g divided by m1 plus m2. If you subbed in at the beginning, that's fine. I just like to save things for the end, um, mainly because we want to create a generalized equation often. And we're hoping that if terms or variables divide themselves out, that means that initially it didn't matter. Okay. In this case over here, nothing did disappear. So every single variable did matter. Okay, so everything mattered, including gravity. Gravity had an influence in our final answer, right? Because uh, from last day's lesson, you might have learned that uh, gravity has no impact on the coefficient of friction for an object that's standing still on a ramp, for example. Sine of 25 degrees minus M2, which is Jane of 75 kilograms times uh, 9.81 meters per second squared, or you could also write it down as newtons per kilogram. That's fine as well. Divided by 1,500 kilograms plus 75 kilograms. Pull out our handy dandy calculator. There you are. And let's crunch away. Remember the close bracket if you have these newer calculators. And I suppose I could have just added them together with 1575. That's OK. And I get 3.48 meters per second squared. I just want to emphasize that this is positive 3.48 meters per second squared. And I'm emphasizing it just to tell you that, yeah, luckily we did this properly. Okay, Our assumptions are correct that the acceleration actually does go down the hill. Uh, why does it matter? Um, because if you got a negative answer, uh, in this case over here, you probably could have just left it be because you would have gotten negative 3.48. All right, you would have been fine. But if friction was involved and you made an assumption that friction went the opposite way than intended, then you need to reset again. All right, so if you assume the force of friction was this way because it was you thought it was accelerating downwards, but instead it accelerated up the ramp instead of down, then yeah, you have to flip force of friction to the opposite side and rearrange for your equations and recalculate everything all over again. Okay, but in this case over here, we're good to go, and we get positive 3.48 meters per second squared. And this positive has a unique meaning for each of these objects because as for Jane, Jane's acceleration is at 3.48 meters per second squared upwards. That's true for her case. But as for the car, the car's acceleration as a vector is at 3.48 meters per second squared down the hill, which is left 25 degrees down, at least in the setup over here, right? 25 degrees, okay, left 25 degrees down. And yep, just for your reference at home, if you really want to screen capture this, by all means, it's the same answer. Okay. 
I think one last thing to emphasize is uh, what is the minimum strength of the rope required to save her? Uh, it's not exactly tensile strength, but it alludes towards that. So if you sub in A into equation one or into equation two, you'll get a numerical value. And it's telling you what the tension on the rope is at that point in time, all right? And the value of T will be different based upon uh, whether the system's moving or if it's not, all right? Or if it's accelerating, just to clarify, if it's accelerating or not. Because if it's accelerating, then the tension will be greater. All right, and you can try this out. If if the car was just bolted to the ground, then the tension on it would just be uh, Jane's weight, which is 75 times 9.81, which is around 750 newtons as opposed to 1,000. Okay, but because the system's accelerating in Jane's favor, the tension on the rope is greater. On the other hand, if the car wasn't heavy enough and ex Jane was accelerating downwards, she won't be falling at 9.81 meters per second squared. She'll be sl falling slightly slower because the car is holding it back up. Right. And while it's holding it up, as it's not supporting her whole weight, you expect the tension to be less than uh, around 750 newtons. If you don't believe me, try it out. All right. Convert the vehicle's weight down to something where the car can't support her, like 15 kilograms, and you'll notice that your, your tension will be less than uh, that in a static situation. So if this F net was equal to 0 newtons, then tension will be equal to mg, which is 75 kilograms times 9.81 newtons per kilogram, which is roughly 750-ish newtons, somewhere in there. I won't show you this video due to potential copyright infringement. Um, it's just emphasizing that um, the tension can cause the rope to break if you accelerate quickly enough. Okay. So um, this is the one where I want you to think critically before solving, because as we said, the system can either accelerate one way or the opposite way. And if you do it wrong, then you have to recalculate everything again. So how would you know which way is the correct way? Well, what you want to do is that you want to find out what's causing the system to accelerate and figure out which has the greater pulling force in the game of tug of war. So on the left hand side over here, we know that due to the force of gravity, this is the component that we're interested in. All right, so mg times the sine of theta. So eight kilograms times 9.81 newtons per kilogram times the sine of 42 degrees. And we're gonna compare it with uh, this side, all right? So we're looking at the component of it, which is also mg times sine theta. So this one is 4.0 kilograms times 9.81 newtons per kilogram times the sine of 69 degrees. All right, so you're going to do a comparison between the two. If the one on the left is greater, then you know that the system's going to accelerate towards the left. If it's the other way around and the right-hand side's greater, then the system will accelerate towards the right. So that's the paper napkin math that you may need to do before you start solving these problems. Oh, by the way, this is from the course pack. So some questions I, I assigned from the textbook and others I assigned from the course pack. Uh, links to all that is available on part, on lesson 1.01 or in the description of this playlist because those links do tend to change over time. Oh, wow, I PowerPointed this out. Good for me. Okay, here's another example. And this is that of the case of what if you have a ridiculously long pulley system? All right. Now you could create a, uh, an equation for each one of them. So at the end of the day, I think in this case over here, you'll have 10 linear equations with, uh, I guess, a lot of unknowns, I guess 10, 10 unknowns, and you can sub and solve, but there is a super shortcut. If all the objects share the same coefficient of friction, and they're all in the same dimension, in other words, they're all moving in line with each other, it could, they could all be moving in line uh, on a ramp at the same elevation or horizontally on the floor or even being all lifted vertically all in unison with each other then you can draw a big circle around them and assume it as one big object and physicists do this all the time and that's why you'll hear these silly jokes about you know a farmer a physicist and a doctor you know try to determine the size of I don't know a chicken coop let's say or even a, a, a cow cow house whatever they call a cow pen cow barn a barn all right um where the punchline of the day is you know suppose the cow is in the shape of a circle all right and that punchline is just emphasizing that yeah you can simplify things okay so that's what we're going to do over here we're just going to simplify it 
So if all the objects share the same coefficient of friction, they're all traveling in the same exact direction, then why not just box them in as one big fat object? Okay, so we're going to add all these masses together, and this is one big fat free body diagram representing all of them. Okay, Kelvin is pulling it forward, so the force of 200 newtons, uh, the force of friction opposes it, um, but the force of friction coefficient is uniform with all of them, or the same with all of them, therefore you can group them all together. All right, so as one big fat object, it's fairly quick to calculate everything else out. Okay, we know that F net is equal to MA. Sure, this is F net is equal to MA, and F net is equal to all the positive forces, subtract all the negative forces. So the force of Kelvin being at 200 newtons, subtract the force of friction, which we just need to quickly calculate out the normal force, where we know that F net uh, in the y dimension will go to zero, which is equal to Fn minus Fg. So our Fn is equal to Fg. Our Fn is equal to, therefore, uh, Mg, which is 143 kilograms times 9.81 uh, newtons per kilogram, which will give us an answer where we can sub it into our force of friction, which is FF is equal to mu k times Fn, which in this case over here is equal to 10% of whatever that calculation is. And we can sub it right in. I know that I have all this power pointed out, and that's why I just want to just cut to the chase. And there you go. 140 newtons for the force of friction. And therefore, uh, Ma is equal to 200 newtons subtract 143 newtons. Mind you, this is the total mass, so don't use the mass of any individual object. So when you isolate for A, that's the acceleration of the entire system. There you go. So instead of creating 10 equations with 10 unknowns, we have one equation with uh, one unknown, and we solve. Okay, but there's two parts to this question, okay? Because first off, you want to find out what the acceleration of the system is. But part B is, well, what exactly is the tension over here? One thing we know logically is that the tension over here is what? That's right. If he's pulling with a force of 200 newtons, then tension over here is 200 newtons. And the tension for every single uh, uh, rope that's after it will be a lot less. All right. So the tension will be big here, but it'll get smaller and smaller and smaller as we go down the chain. However, in this question over here, the, we're wondering what is the tension at this point here? And yes, it is tempting to create a free body diagram for this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy to eventually solve for this one over here. But how about we just reincorporate the super shortcut again? If all these guys share the same coefficient of friction, why not just draw a box around these last four uh, wagons, like so, and solve away? One thing you do need to redo again is the force of friction. Because remember, the force of friction now has to deal with the last four boxes, not all of them. Okay, so you'll sit down and calculate the force of friction one more time. And we know that it's the tension that allows it to move forwards and it's the force of friction, the residual amount from the seven kilograms that hold it back. Okay, the mass is seven kilograms and acceleration we just solved for earlier. So we can just sub everything in. Okay, or how I did it over here was I rearranged MA plus the force of friction is equal to T4. So seven kilograms times the acceleration that we calculated out earlier plus the force of friction, which increases the tension, which it should, will tell us the corresponding tension. And there you have it. That's how you solve these problems really fast and really quick. Make sure you go through the textbook questions, the course back questions, and we'll meet each other in the next episode. See you later.